Joining me now here on the Knicks Film School pregame show, we are previewing the NBA's in-season tournament first round matchup or the quarterfinals or the knockout stage. I have no idea what we're calling this game, but all I do know is that it's an excuse for me to go out to the Midwest and talk to my good friend, Mr. Ty Windish of the Eurostep podcast. I did not think I would see him again until Christmas let alone uh, for a fifth time this season now that the Knicks are playing the Bucks again. Uh, Ty, how you doing, man? I'm good. It was This has nothing to do with the in-season tournament, which I am very excited. To, I've been a proponent of. I'm very excited. I didn't notice until recently. Have you seen the 23rd, 25th schedule for this month? Yeah. Between it's Bucks? A, it's so weird. The Knicks now play the Bucks four times in the it's first It's not just like, that, though. Months. Yeah. It, it, two days before Christmas, they have a matinee before the Christmas game, which is also during the day, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why? I, so this is a, a theme that we've been discussing. This schedule that they've made crazy. For, it seems like every team is just crazy. The Knicks have played six back to backs already so far this year, and wow. here's how the in season tournament breaks out for them. It actually, I don't know. I'm, this is going to turn into a question for you, so I'll I'll lead you that way. But sure. like the fact that the Knicks make the tournament and it's supposed to be an honor. You made the quarterfinals of the first ever in season tournament. Let's say they lose. Okay, let's predict that they lose to the Bucks on Tuesday. They then have to fly back to New York to play the next night against the loser of uh, Celtics and um, Pacers. I guess technically, I forget. I know the games at the Garden if they play the Pacers, and then the games in Boston if they play the Celtics. So it's another back to back. Wait, wait, now it's on Wednesday, really? It's not on Thursday. Game, it's a back to back. Yes, the game, oh, the consolation weird. game, is on Wednesday. Then, if the Knicks somehow win against the Bucks, I shouldn't say somehow. I actually think that the it's yeah, a good conversation to have somehow. on how well yeah. they mac up. Yeah, we'll see. Um, but the let's say the Knicks win against the Bucks on on Tuesday night. They then go out to Vegas and enjoy Las Vegas. They, they go to Nevada, right? And then they play a game on Thursday. And then if they win that game, they play on Saturday in the championship. So they spend another couple days in that time zone. They then have a game on Monday at the Garden in against Toronto, which is then followed by a trip back to the West Coast for a five-game road trip. There's this schedule that they've made is absolutely brutal. And December is kind of the worst. So I I leave this to a question for a Bucks team that while they've they've ridden the ship and they're winning games, I, I mean I have some questions about how much writing has been done, but just flatly ask, would it have been easier if you just missed the stupid tournament, played some easier teams potentially at home, and then, you know, you get to watch over the weekend? Like, would it be better for the Bucks, specifically as we've asked, it'd be better for the Knicks if you just missed the tournament completely? I don't think so. Um, okay. I think this group has a lot to prove given the start, especially defensively and just all over. Um, and I think they're kind of fired up to be on this stage and kind of prove also like, Everyone on earth has won Eastern Conference Player of the Week besides Giannis so far. So I feel like this Bucks team has a little bit of like, no, you know what? Let's go to Vegas and show up. We got a dame. And we feel like people are kind of, you know, the Heat people now are saying they would rather have Jaime Jaquez than Dame contracts considered. Like, let's 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 go show the world what Dame and Giannis is like. So I, I'm not mad about it. Also, I know like Cleveland got a pretty hard two day thing for not making it. So you never know. I would rather go and, you know, see, I I mean, to be honest, I think we can, we're among friends here and all of our Mm -hmm. listeners on both pods are friends. Being in the East, we play a lot of really bad teams already. I don't need two more. I don't care that much about strength. This gonna give me some good games. I'm down with it. Give me some good competitive national. I don't need to see the Wizards. The Wizards games are always closed for whatever reason. The Hawks play the Bucks well. I don't need to see that. Let, let, oh, I'm down. Let me give me Phoenix. That's fun to me. Speaking as someone who covers a team that just had a three and zero week, two of which came against the two and nineteen Pistons, and one of which came against the Hornets, who have actually you started had to, to be sweating on those Pistons. Uh, that games. Pistons game. <laughs> I, you, there's the moment where you see the light and you think it's the end of the tunnel, but you'd never know if it's the end, like if it's an oncoming train. And that entire third quarter, because like the Knicks got off to like a, an awful start, but they were up 14. So it was like, all right, so our C minus game could win by 30. And then it's a one point game going into the fourth quarter. And you're just, 
oh my God, we're going to be the team. We're going to be the team. And thankfully, That's what everyone's thinking. You, the more Lakers, confident you tell. teams prevailed, you know. That, yeah. that Lakers team played super hard in that Pistons game. You could tell LeBron and them were like, no, it's not going to be us, man. <laughs> well, now that they got bogey back, it's it's yeah. legitimate. Like they got their second score. That was the conversation during the pregame pod. It was like, yeah. look, the Pistons are bad. Don't get me wrong, but it's just Kate out there. And in the Knicks game, they get like a uh, uh, Killian Hayes decided he was just going to be like Chris Paul from the mid range and hit his threes. And he had he I provided that games. second scoring option. So. Um, you know, we'll see who eventually breaks breaks that streak. But um, I'm happy to hear you say that you, you know, you'd rather be in the tournament, specifically that this team seems to rather be in the tournament. Um, and I, I I go back to last year for the Knicks, where we're recording this on December 4th, which is which is a bit of an iconic anniversary for the Knicks. It's the day that their season turned around. They went 37 and 22. They switched to a nine man rotation. And like all of their rankings, they became like a really good uh, offensive team. They were third in offense and like fourth in net rating from this point on the rest of the year. And we circled that day on the calendar as like, okay, things are different since then. They're, they're end of the year rankings. We, we qualify them with the caveat that before December 4th, they didn't know who they were yet. And with the Bucks this year, I know that they started off with some questions and some rumblings behind the scenes that the defensive scheme wasn't the greatest. When we talked last, you weren't happy with the defensive scheme that they were running and how how bad it was. And then the Knicks game happened that, that Friday was, yeah, night. That was the game, exactly. And Brooke went back to a drop and had eight blocks. And since yeah. then, it's a much more respectable standing for the Bucks. While teams are scoring, it's not last or completely a dead last in the NBA. So am I reading that right? That since yeah. that, since that Knicks game is where Bucks fans are like, that's the turnaround. Literally every game now after the Bucks play and I see the stats are up on, on NBA stats. I go and pull up the advance. So the offensive defensive rating and net from November 3rd until whatever today is. So it's, it's been about a full what we month did all now. last year. We're the same, yeah. exactly the same. And, yeah. and it's just, and even it's funny because like the availability hasn't been great for the Bucks as well. I'm sure we'll talk about for this game in particular, the wing depth is really pushed with Crowder and Conadin both out for this game. And probably, for, I mean, certainly for a bit longer, I think Pat's not going to play this week. Crowder's probably out another month. So um, it's not like the situation has been ideal. Literally though, it's just, they started dropping his base against the Knicks the mood into that game, I was getting a little worried. It was like, oh man, this coaching rumbling, this could be real if they're going to try and do this all year. And the players, I would presume Giannis and Chris probably two of the loudest given they've been there for so long and seeing Brooke do this and Giannis, especially, you know, when Brooke missed a lot of a season with his back injury, Giannis was like, dude, I don't want to play center. I hate this. I miss Brooke. Brooke is awesome. So they they talked, they they had a meeting with the coach, they tried it. And ever since, I think they're like 12th in defensive rating league-wide in that, in that time. So, you know, not where you're used to seeing the Bucs, but clearly they made a big shift toward offense and they're, they've been a top five offense over most samples throughout the year. Uh, and their, cr- their clutch numbers even more so. I think number one, offense and net, because it's really hard to stop Dame, Giannis, Chris Middleton as your clear third option, Brooke Lopez, Malik Beasley spacing. I mean, that unit has been awesome this season. Um, so, yeah, it's been great to see, even though it feels worse. I think offense around the league is just crazy. The fact that they haven't been a horrible defense, even that Bucks fans will tell you they're maybe 30th because they're, they're spoiled defensively. Um, but, yeah, they've, they've righted the ship a bit. I think they still have more writing to go, but uh, they're winning games, as you said. Well, so the winning games part is obviously the most important part. And you look at even just the most recent games where, look, I, 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 I had the Bucks and their money line and I jumped on it again live during the Blazers game. And I was very confused what was going on. And in our gambling chat, we were just like, all right, let's trust the Bucks will, will come back in this. And then we're watching the lead slowly get smaller and smaller in the fourth quarter. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously they came back and win. But like, what do you say to the outsider that looks at some of their recent games, whether it be the the Portland game where they had to overcome a 26 point deficit or only beating Washington by three or only beating the heat in the fourth quarter without Jimmy Butler, or like you did just lose in overtime to the Bulls. Lost, so what do you say to someone that sees that the Bucks seem to be not flirting with disaster? Because I don't think disaster is a, a, a necessary word to go, but that they, they play with their food a bit and then sometimes they get bit. 
Yeah, I think it's a combination of there's still a work in progress on both ends. I think they're still getting better, which is, you know, what should be your point, especially year one of a new system, year one incorporating Dame. Uh, I think they still have a long way to go, which is not me. It's not I, I don't view that as a negative, right? Like I, whether, whatever their record is, 13 and four or whatever, like they're still they're still getting the good result you want to see in the standings. The game to game has been a little sloppy. I think that, again, they just have a lot of improvement. But the other thing, as I mentioned, I think that wing depth has just really it, they, they've been hurt. You know, I think they lost mm. a little depth in the Dame trade. I think Jay Crowder was their best two way wing. I, I don't count Giannis. Giannis is his own thing. He hasn't played in, in, yeah. in a month. Yeah, he's, you know, big, whatever. He's Giannis. He's but, Giannis, you know, yeah. Yeah, he's Giannis. He's the superstar um, position, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Chris, you know, defensively is not really the same. They just don't have many two-way wing players or just perimeter defenders, period. And then you add to that, now Conradin is out. Andre Jackson Jr. missed a game and has some back tightness. He may or may not play against the Knicks. And I think their bench in, in, as a whole has just been very inconsistent. I was looking like the last two weeks. So that includes, I believe when I look this up, it includes the Bulls game and that Blazers game for sure. And those Wizards games, like their starting unit was good. You know, when they had their starting five, that they were winning like net rating of double digits. Same with Pat Connaughton in for Chris when he was playing. He's one of the first subs or most common subs because Chris is still out of minutes restriction, although it's bigger than last time the Knicks and Bucks played. But the bench has just been bad. I mean, they just haven't gotten enough scoring. Cameron Payne is just a streaky player, but really Bobby Portis, who it was nice to see him in Bucks Hawks really step up and and take more of that scoring mantle on. But I think he had like eight points on eight, six or eight points on like sixteen shots over the Bucks two games previous to that combined, and they just had no nothing from their bench. And it's not like they're running all bench lineups, but. You know, the combinations when you have a couple bench guys in there, if you're just not getting anything offensively and not much defensively from any of those guys, I think that's really what hurt them. They were a team who got off to really bad starts, like pre-first time out, they would be consistently down. That trend has reversed, but then it's the time between that first time out and the end of the first quarter. You'll see teams get back into it. So I think some of these younger players need to step up. Marjan Beauchamp has been, you know, pretty just like inconsistent to, to put it kindly. Uh, I, I just expect campaigns either going to be a flamethrower or unplayable game to game. That's just kind of who he is, but Portis needs to be more consistent for sure as well. So it's funny you mentioned Bochamp because that first Knicks Bucks game where the Knicks like to play a lot of drop and um, they've, they've actually fix some of their closeout issues. Like there's certain guys you you want to leave open, you want to let shoot. And Bochamp and Crowder were two of the guys that they they were fine with. And um both <laughs> of those guys went for seven of uh, eleven from three combined in that yeah. game. Um the other player is Giannis who had, off the top of your head, if you know how many threes Giannis has made this year. Um if I know his guess. percentage is like 19. So I'm gonna guess he's made Nine. He's made eight. Do you know how many he's oh. made against the Knicks? I cheated. I have the box score up so you can so see. So you have it. I up. Just so they're three. Yeah. So Giannis is, has five threes. I believe he's five of 32 <laughs> against the rest of the league this year. And he was three or three against the Knicks that night. And I think that's yeah. why Knicks fans are coming in with some kind of confidence in this game. It's like the last time that the Knicks and Bucks played. RJ wasn't there. Julius was on a different planet. Like, do you want to talk yeah. about Eastern Conference Player of the Week and and how things have changed? Like, the reigning Ju- uh, Eastern Conference Player of the Week, Julius Randle, now is coming into this matchup. Whereas the last time he was on a historic pace to start the season for how bad he was. Yeah. And um, the other thing that I think Knicks fans will, are coming in a little bit confident with this matchup is their real Achilles heel. Like, I think they're, they're, they're third in defense at the moment, and I think it's a, a sustainable third in defense. But the biggest Achilles heel to that defense can be when it's not set. You can beat them in transition. And from what I can tell, the Bucks are not a transition team. They're Especially when you go to clean the glass, it's, it's very blue. Is that a fair thing to be confident about? Or do you just say like, yes, you, you might be able to beat us in transition and specifically the Knicks second unit, which might have their best lineup, um, can actually can beat you. And it's their be- it's it's one of their best plus minus lineups um, and it likes to run. So like, 
is it fair to be confident that we can beat the Bucks because they're not going to beat us in transition? They're not a great offensive rebounding team. Or you just kind of go back to like, we have Dame, we have Giannis, like in clutch time. We'll I, I, figure always, it out. I always go back to those things to a certain extent. Okay, uh, it, is, it. it is nice to have those two. I think the transition thing, I find it really interesting because I thought early in the year they were more aggress- aggressive on the offensive glass, but not they weren't effective at it. And so they, they would get beat back a lot. Like, mm. you know, a, a trailer gets there immediately and they're just giving up open dunks. The numbers have remained bad for their transition defense. Part of it, I wonder if they're getting back and then just still getting beat because they just don't have great defensive personnel. To be honest, I have from eye test, I have seen less of like, Oh, they just gave up another two on one fast break. Cause they didn't get back. There's some here or there. I thought it was a much bigger problem early in the season, but you know, you get cross matched or something, even if the bucks get back, a guy like Jalen Brunson is going to give trouble to pretty much anyone who ends up on him. I mean, that sometimes the bucks best chance is like, it's Brooke Lopez and the guy just tries to shoot over him, which is harder to do than everyone thinks like that's, that can be a good result sometimes for the bucks, ironically. Um, but I think transition for the Knicks is going to be a, a key place. And then the other thing I, I look at when it's, you know, how could New York win this game? Brunson has four, 45 again. I think he had 45 last time. 45. He needed one other, and is- one other teammate to show up and he didn't. He didn't yeah. That, so you know? the, so the, I think, yeah, I would pencil in, you know, Brunson to score over whatever anyone would project him to if you're playing on any sort of daily fantasy or other uh, platform, as okay. I always do with a bu- a bu- a point guards playing the Bucks. But it's like, can someone else or the whole team step up around him? Clearly, last time it didn't happen. That's where, like, I know RJ Barrett, who seems to have kind of tailed off after coming back from injury, like, could he do it? Randall, who I know has played much better overall, but still. Like the threes not falling, I, I think that's kind of important to being the second guy and being able to leverage that space. Can it be one of the X number of Knicks young guards on this roster? Can one of them hit the threes? I know. I think Quickly's percentage is down a little bit this year. Or, or maybe it's just never been as high outside of the one season. That's that's my big thing. Like I think Brunson's going to find joy. I think it's like can, I, I almost think the Bucks at this point, the way their defense works, they're just like. Okay, the guard can hit a bunch of shots off mid range. That's fine. Like it, we'll give up forty on twenty shots to Jalen Brunson mm. if we have to, or maybe not that. Maybe that's a bad equation. But forty on twenty five shots. But if if nobody else gets going, like we can live. We think you'll miss eventually. We'll, we think we'll make enough plays, and then if it is late, we trust ourselves in a clutch situation. I gotta be honest, Ty. It sounds like the answer to the question I just asked was like, yeah, we have Damon Giannis. Like yeah, you, might be able, you might beat us in the trend in the transition department where we don't like to run. Even if you do, you might even score points that way. I, I, I actually, it's going to go off. You know, I think they want to run. I just don't think they get many they turnovers for the same. Okay. I mean, they're, they play an aggressive defense. I think the point is to get out and transition more. They just have not been good at forcing. Like they've, they're, they've not been good at the things they want to do. I know their turnover forcing rate is up from last year because they just played a non-aggressive defense. But the personnel, I mean, it's like Malik Beasley and, you know, uh, young players, Bobby Port. I mean, Bobby Port is actually trapping. has been one of their most effective traps. He'll come up as part of those second units, and he actually does a pretty good job on the ball handler. But a lot of the time, they'll, like, force a travel or a pass out of bounds or something. I, I think they want to run. I just don't think they've gotten as many opportunities. So, I mean, that does check out in the in the cleaning the glass department where they're 28th in points per possession on uh, transition points. And you go right to the next column and their frequency is uh 24th. So yeah. it's that they're not, they're just not running and they're not like the, yeah. the live rebounds, the steals. They're not a team that runs a lot, even if they, they want to. Um, yeah. I look, we have a, the Knicks have a clutch guy in Brunson that I, he just continues to exceed all expectations. To your point about, about RJ, while the uh, look, I think only the most of optimistic Knicks fans thought he was going to shoot fifty percent from three all year. Um, the thing that is still encouraging to those of us that have been frustrated with him in the past is that the defense hasn't tailed off um, significantly, and he's still making some very correct reads, uh, both on on ball and in passing lanes. Um, you know, if he normalizes out and is is just like kind of a low efficiency player and but still averages around like 19, 20 a game, but he's still like an above average defender, I'll take it. Like that's that's the place I am with RJ at the moment. And then 
like Josh Hart is coming off his best week of the season so far. And while quickly is can be hot or cold. And when he's hot, it's like game changing. But when he's cold, he doesn't play the play, doesn't close the game. Um, we have DiVincenzo that comes in and is sh- like shot 56% from three on like high volume last week. So um, look, the Knicks come in playing well. And I'm, I'm really curious about this game. If look, they're going to get the chance to play the Bucks a lot over the next month. So <laughs> I yeah. don't know if it's a good or a bad thing that we get a look at one of the best teams in the NBA that as they're still like in their getting used to each other phase. And as much as like, I want to say like there are p- the things to, to poke holes in, at the Bucks and their start to the season. It's like, yeah, they're still 14 and six. They're still the three seed in, in the Eastern Conference. Like there's there's room for them to get better. And they're still on pace for like 55, 56 wins. Um, I guess the only other question I have about like how the Bucks have done so far is like they they made their bones. I and mean, we talked about this the last time that there were like a an offense that was going to get enough done and there were a defense that was at times impenetrable and they lived off of that. Like we're going to live off of defense and they've made the trade off this year long term. Cause it, like, we'll just ask it like the Celtics are going to be the team you have to beat and you're going to have to outscore. Do you think you're still confident that that trade off was necessary and will be something that benefits the, the bucks long term uh, in a matchup against the Celtics? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I I think there's going to be a roster reshuffle at some point. I mean, they just, I mean, logically, they built a group around Drew Holiday at point guard. I mean, you look at Malik Beasley. I mean, Crowder is a two way player, but, you know, he's not a top flight defender at this point. You mean Dame Lillard at point guard, right? No, I mean, they oh, you built mean it like around they built Drew the Holiday. Group. Okay, so yeah, they built I mean, it around they, they Drew get, Holiday, and then the they, trade happens right before the season. And now okay. they're, they, you know, they, they, like, they had Wes Matthews around. They had Javon Carter. They let those guys go because it's like, hey, you know, we've got the best perimeter defender in the league. We need more scoring. Our problem is, you know, we'll get stops. Our offense just goes to hell, and then teams go on these crazy runs, which happened again against Miami. I think it happened against Boston when they went to seven in that playoff series. You know, they the Celtics weren't putting like 140 on them. The Bucs just couldn't get enough buckets. And Giannis carried them to seventh game. And then he was just clearly out of steam. I think the whole team was. So I think you look at what's been their problem and you look at how, you know, they won one with all that defense, but it was such a grind the whole time and it looked like they were dead against Brooklyn. And then, you know, things change. But, and, you know, Giannis gets hurt against Atlanta. They go down 0-2 against Phoenix. Like, Nothing about it was easy. They, they, you know, they won. They, they were the champions, but it wasn't like they rampaged through the playoffs. Uh, they, they rampaged through Miami, which was awesome. But outside <laughs> of that, you know, it was it was very hard. And I think you look at, you know, what could we do to make it easier in those situ- those situations that really matter. To be clear, and it's like, oh, if Dame is there, you just can't do what teams have all, literally always done to Giannis as long as he's been a, an apex player, right? Like load up the paint you know, make him beat three guys and he can't do it enough. He'll do it, but he can't do it enough. And now you just can't anymore. And we've seen like when they really try and they, they run their, their clutch offense and they're going on both ends. Like they get, they, they just walk into good looks every time. I mean, when Chris is the third guy, when Malik Beasley or Brooke Lopez and the dunker, the guys who leave open, like they're, 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 it's so easy for them in a way that it just never was before. So I think you, you certainly lose a lot defensively, but also the best offensive players routinely beat the best defensive players in big games in the playoffs. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was great having Drew. I mean, he had some huge moments for the Bucks, no question. I'm not taking anything away from that. And, you know, same with like Drew and PJ Tucker were like, you know, the, the two guarding KD. And KD had like a hard earned 50. You know, it's not like they were holding him to 25. <laughs> you know, it's, at a certain point, the best offensive players win. In that series. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, okay, you know, we've tried the defensive thing. Let's see. What if we have two guys that can go get the hard 50? And what does that look like? And, you know, what if we can get just enough stops? And I think that is what their defense is going to be. It's like, you're going to beat them sometimes, but like Brooke has a huge block. Giannis has like a lunging steal in transition, you know, whatever it may be. And then on the other end, like they're just not guardable. So I, I think I, I like the idea. And also I think going away from the stylistic perspective, they got, they got a better player and yeah. you know, in the playoff and, and a better fit, a better player and a better fit for, for the other best player. And I think you just kind of have to do that when you have Giannis. And that's why he signed another extension is because they, they don't hesitate to do these things to give themselves a 1% better chance. Um, so I think, 
I think they're going to rejigger the roster a little more to be a little more defense around them. And right now they're just like kind of finding ways to just like Malik Beasley, please. And he tries his best. He's not very good, but he tries his best on defense. Uh, he's a very good offensive player. I don't remember yeah, what the original question was, but no, nah, just is the trade off worth it? Yeah. You still, yeah, yeah, yeah. you still do you, do you have any worries at all that the trade off you made might have actually, you know, hurt them in a potential series against Boston? And it sounds like oh, you want, you'd Boston, rather. Yeah. And th- I think Boston specifically, too, even with their yeah. new super, their new super squad. Like, I think they're. I just don't know how much difference the better defensive per- I mean, they were really bad at points in that game. They need to be better than they were when we played them. But like assuming they don't just get beat constantly one on one off the dribble, which I feel like by a playoff setting they'll be a little better. Like Boston's the kind of team where they, they shoot over you a bunch either way, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's how they play. I mean, they they drive and kick, they shoot over you, they take threes over you. Like I just I don't look at it as that much of a drastically different match up on that side. I mean, the Porzingis addition and how they play in true five out is a bigger difference. Yeah. But I mean, I, like I saw Drew get beat by Tatum a bunch anyway, and then Drew beat Tatum a bunch, but I also saw Tatum shoot over and miss over worse defenders too. So I think I'd rather have the offense when Boston is really, you know, they, they've really made it. So especially when Christmas time against them, nobody besides Giannis did anything and it just wasn't sustainable. So Giannis could have waited to sign that extension, by the way, right? Yeah. And he, yeah. so what to the uneducated, what was the reason that you think so, or you know that he signed a year early? This is actually fascinating. So Bobby Marks and ESPN and others had all agreed he should wait a year because he can get a bigger overall contract if he waits right. a year. But I think, and I think, I think we do have reporting now that like the Bucks came up with this and presented it to him that if his goal is to retire a buck. He signs now and then another one. And then I think he gets another one in before the over 38 rule would mess with it. So instead of maximizing one contract, Mm. it's maximizing the next decade, which to me, it's like very exciting that Giannis was sold on a a vision of how can I play in Milwaukee for 10 more years? I think that rules. But I also love that the Bucks were like, you know, some teams, I think kind of, oh, he's not going to sign. Who cares? Like John Horace went down and made this presentation to him in person when he was working out with Hakeem. And then they met in Chicago to go over the like over 38 thing. Like they really pushed for this um, and they made it happen, which is great. So, I mean, as a Knicks fan, I, the the superstar trade has been out and rumored for them for, for years oh, now. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't even have like a Knicks Giannis trade conver- question for you. It's very much like, do you think that's gone? Like, do you now expect he's oh, going to yeah. retire a buck? Okay. Well, you know, not even the Knicks any... portion, just like, like no, I know yeah, like, yeah. The, the week that he signed the extension, even I got annoyed at it. Like I, I like Howard Beck, but he writes the column. Like this doesn't guarantee that he's, uh, like, yeah, yeah, we yeah. just saw Dame get traded after signing an extension. And it's like, can, can we long for the days when guys actually want to yeah. be with their teams forever? You know? I mean, I, I listen, I, I never say never. And, and, you know, maybe four years from now, three years from now, it's it's a different story. I, I think they have to continue being competitive. I do think it gets harder every time as the assets and all this other talk and everything. And I think if there was a situation in, in three years, I mean, maybe as you get to the tail end, he's just like, yeah, I'll play it out, whatever. As While he's still in his prime, if they truly just corroded around him, I, I think maybe it happens then if they can't pull another rabbit out of the hat as they've done with Drew and now Dame. But also the front rock front office has a track record where I think you should just assume they're going to find ways to get guys who want to play with the honest there, which is crazy for a team in Milwaukee. But I mean, they keep doing it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I feel relative. I feel as confident as ever. I mean, this is when we talked last, my same position was like, I think as long as they they're competitive, he's going to stay. And if they're not, then I don't blame him leaving because, you know, we all know about the rings conversations and how we treat player legacies and everything. And, you know, he should want to win. So I, I hope that they continue to be aligned as they've been. Well, we'll see. Obviously, long term about that. And obviously, we'll see in this matchup with the, the Knicks and Bucks, who, again, I maybe it's it's silly for me to think this, but I do think these two teams match up well enough. It's played the last three times they've played each other. It's been three very close games. Granted. Dame Lillard wasn't there for two of them, um, but Julius Randle wasn't there for one of them. And I'm talking about three games he played in. So you do that math um, however you want to do it. Before we go, any questions uh, you have about the Knicks? What's up? Well, yeah, I think what's interesting to me about this matchup, and I feel like a lot of it may come down to, and this was, you kind of mentioned with Crowder and Bochamp and their hot shooting, like 
both teams kind of have a four or five that isn't super stretchy. I mean, Brooke is, you know, moderately, but, you know, for the Knicks with Randall Mitchell and for the Bucks with Giannis and Brooke. And what's interesting is I've always felt good about those matchups generally. Like the Cavs are kind of like that too, because, okay, I like, I think our guys are better. And just talking about the four or five, like Brooke mm-hmm. is a great defender. Robinson gives him trouble because he's just the vertical spacing is so great. But Brooke is such a great defender. And then, of course, Giannis is Giannis. But I think now with the leaky perimeter defense is where there's more vulnerability for Milwaukee in terms of just outside shooters or just guards in general and perimeter players beating. So I guess how do you see that concept of like, okay, let's just take the four fives out of it for a minute. We know both teams are going to be relatively a bit cramped offensively, I think the Knicks more so. Like, how does the Knicks offense beat that? Beat the Bucks being able to, whether it's zone or dropping, of just being in the paint and like, hey, we have Brooke and Giannis here for a lot of the game. Like, you've got to not rely on the rim as much. So it's funny you mentioned the, the that buck. You mentioned the Bucks game against the Knicks as kind of a turning point for the Bucks, whereas like Mitchell Robinson had six offensive rebounds and it's been an offensive rebound machine this year. Although teams have started to like just send an extra guy because they're tired of they're just tired of him getting six, seven offensive rebounds a game. But like in that game, it was zero points but fifteen rebounds, and they're like at the rim right now. The Knicks are dead last in the NBA with a decent frequency. So the fact that they're still able to be um, where they are offensively, which I believe is 11th, last I checked, um, says they still are able to find ways to score points. And I cannot believe I'm saying this about a Tom Thibodeau team. It's because they're taking a ton of threes. So while I agree I with you... I believe it when I looked. I think I just had it pulled up. They are like... They were 10th in frequency, and then they they Julius Randle just kind of owned the Raptors in the paint this weekend, and so or on Friday, and so like their their frequency went down a little bit. But man, I believe they're either 10th or 11th in frequency, and then seventh in percentage at the moment. Yes, they are. Which they're is, t- actually tied sixth with Philly in terms of three point percentage, and just in raw attempts per game, which is an imperfect stat. They're yeah. currently 12th, which I expect. I was like, I pulled it up before the pod. I was like, ah, oh, Knicks. I'm sure even if they're shooting well, they're probably like. Bottom 10. I was like, whoa, nah, man, it's like that. It's part of their DNA is like, we're going to take a ton of threes. The the modern shot chart that exists amongst this, this basketball team, which is why I like the Obi Toppin thing. Like I just admittedly, I'm actually enjoying the fact that Obi's in a system right now that is maximizing his offensive ability and he's getting a chance to play through his mistakes, but they replaced him with DiVincenzo in the rotation. And it's just, fit like a glove like Josh yeah. Hart now is your full-time four who's able to crash the boards the way a Tibbs team needs to and then he's able to just get out and run the way a Tibbs team wants to play apparently in the second unit and it's creating these transition opportunities him also not hesitating to shoot has now created some opportunities because yeah. he's starting to make them when he takes them and then DiVincenzo again like I, there's a starting lineup controversy at the moment here in New York where well, Quentin Grimes in the lineup with him has been fine. It's like a plus six for the year, which isn't isn't bad. Um, take Quentin Grimes out, put Dante DiVincenzo in. It's plus 30. Take Quentin Grimes wow. out, put Emmanuel quickly in. It's plus 24. Like, they have otherworldly lineups when it's not Quentin Grimes. And that's basically what they go to in the second quarter and then the fourth quarter. So, like, that's how they're beating teams despite not really getting any production at the rim at the moment. They're not a great free throw shooting team. They're like 29th in effective field goal percentage. And yet their offensive rebounding and the three point shooting and just the fact that Jalen Brunson is a straight up G in the fourth quarter is yeah. like been the reason they've been winning games. So, yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to see like if Milwaukee can keep them off the three point line. That's something we've seen like, I don't remember which game it was. It might have even been Portland, that crazy Portland game. Mm-hmm. But like there was a game when you could see clearly the Bucks at halftime that came out, and they're just like, we're just going to run every shooter off the line. And if you make a floater, fine. But we're, we can't let you keep shooting these threes. So I wonder if we'll see that. I wonder the Bucks have used a lot more different defensive coverages. So I would imagine we see their switching, which this will be actually a great test. Their switching has probably been their worst coverage just in terms of execution like they've gotten lost on rotations so seeing if they can keep all these perimeter guys in front of them i mean the knicks are big down low but so many like easy to lose players outside of randall and mitchell robinson and and uh, any other centers who play so i'm really excited to see how milwaukee defends without crowder now and 
potentially without Jackson Jr. I mean, it's like sounds silly for a 36th overall rookie pick, but Ajax is like a big deal. They just they really like his defense and athleticism. And I think especially, as you said, that second unit that likes to run for New York, all the rangy players, they would really like to have him. Bochamp has just been uh, he has some really good moments on the perimeter defensively. And then like he travels on a fast break or mm. stuff like it's just like it's been a tough experience. So maybe it could be a bounce back game for him, too, though. Well, the last time he played the Knicks, he hit four threes. So yeah, maybe we're, he'll we're, be able to channel that. We're all fully expecting for some kind of bounce back that will haunt us forever. I should Knicks fans. I, I know. I know my my people. They're gonna get mad if I don't make the correction for them. It's the quickly lineup that is plus thirty one. It's the Divincenzo lineup that's plus sixteen. So I wanted to make sure that is I clarify that net, net rating or total that plus is minus point dif- that is point differential on uh what's it called? It's net rating on cleaning the glass. Jeez. when You go to the lineup data that the oh the five man unit of Jalen Brunson. Josh Hart, Julius Randle, Mitchell Robinson, and quickly is in the 99th percentile. And then with DiVincenzo is in the 81st percentile. Now they have two other lineups that are positives. Their bench unit, which is um, RJ with the bench is like plus three, which is like, it's fine. You know, like it's, yeah. it's a positive, you know, it's yeah, what you want from your bench unit. Um, and then they're starting five at the moment is plus six. They just have these two other units that they go to that, they just they that's how they've been building these leads or getting back into games. It's with those other two lineups. And I'm I'm curious because I think they like you said, they're like they can't take advantage of their strength in in the paint against Milwaukee because Giannis is there, because Portis is there, because Lopez is there. So yeah. I don't expect like what Randall did on Friday night against Siakam and Pirtle for four quarters. It's just, it's something clicked inside him in the first quarter. It's like, Oh, they can't stop me. And because yeah. he's like passing now, like he's passing you know, out of double teams even quicker than he used to. Like the guy's averaging close to six assists a game at the moment. Um, I don't expect that in this game. I expect like they may just have to make it a net neutral. And if you get hot from three, you got a shot. If Jalen Brunson goes off for 40 again, you got a real shot. And yeah, you know, we'll we'll see what happens if our which version of RJ Barrett shows up. And I think to, on that note, which version of Portis and and Payne? Just knowing the the bench guys, the Bucks are without. I looked so last time they combined two for eleven against the Knicks, combined like four total points. If it's like that again, then the Knicks probably win. Like the Bucks need as as great as Giannis and Dame are. I mean, they're not running them forty four minutes, right? Like you need some contribution outside of the starting five, unless it was like you know all five of the starters really went off, which is possible. But I would guess, you know, we're going to be looking after that game and going, oh, either, you know, Portis was able to put up 12 and eight and really make a big difference in his minutes or, oh, they really struggled in the Bobby Porter. And that's the Knicks kind of blew the game open a little bit there. And the Bucks couldn't get all the way back, which has kind of been a couple of their losses have been like, oh, you played with them for too long and didn't give yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Celtics game, they ended up being so close. They were just so bad. They, they couldn't make layups for like two weeks. Also, I don't really know. What was going on? Like they were at the rim a bunch, like against Washington. Giannis is rising, ball in his hand right by the rim. And it mm-hmm. just like squirts out and goes out of bounds. I've never seen a team just forget how to finish at the rim for like a week. And it really hurt them in that stretch. I think some of that's random. Like I think every yeah. team goes through that stretch where it's just like there's a lid on the rim. Like the Knicks, yeah. as I mentioned, where they are when it comes to finishing at the rim at the moment. And well, I, I do think sometimes they're just a poor finishing team. And that's why the the Mitchell Robinson of it all is part of their the DNA. Like they're okay taking a contested, <clears throat> excuse me, taking a contested floater or a layup because they know that if I'm bringing the other guy over to me, Mitch is now yeah, wide Mitch open for a good back. Yeah. Um, same thing for Julius. So like, I don't know. I, I Sometimes it's just been like, all right, that usually goes down, but it's not like whether it be yeah. quickly or RJ or Brunson, like some of these just seem like it's, it's starting to normalize out. Um, but we'll see. I, I, the Bucks Knicks game was a very fun matchup, despite yeah. the fact of what Julius was when they played then. And I'm hoping as long as he's not that, it'll be an uptick and be a, again a fun matchup between two teams that I think are are towards the top of the Eastern Conference. Yeah, I think as you mentioned there's just the offensive rebounding of it all for New York. That's going to be another one of the you know after oh, yeah. the game. I think if like if the Knicks go and create, I mean like that Cavs playoff series. Like if it's anything close to that, just on the boards, yeah. it won't be as sad as that for the Bucks. I don't think thankfully, but I like don't think so just because I don't think the Bucks are going to like 
see headlights at a certain point. That's the no, biggest yeah, thing about that. that. Thing. Yeah. But like they, but like as far as the disparity of like if the Knicks have ten extra possessions on the offensive glass, yeah, I think I think yeah, I, I don't yeah. seriously think it would go the whole way like that playoff series, but just the off. I mean, as you mentioned, Hart, Randall, um, Mitchell Robinson, the Bucks have not been very good on preventing those. Some of those mm-hmm. again, like they've I've seen so many guys just like have a ball right in front of them and not fully grab it. It's an offensive rebound. It's kind of driving Bucks fans crazy, and the Knicks are so well equipped to take advantage of that. I think that's going to be another like how how close is the possessions overall, and how many second chance points to the Knicks? Get? And I'd say like the Bucks defense. I think honestly has been kind of flat, like solid throughout the last solidly mid. But it's like the worst games are either points off turnovers or second chance points. So either not rebounding or not taking care of the ball. I think if the Bucs do well at those two things, they have a good shot, even with some shooting variance either way. I think if they're bad at one or both, that's when it's like, oh, they could definitely lose that game. So let's wrap up here. Let We can't pick our teams, but let's pick oh. a finals and a winner for the in-season tournament. Let's just play it out. You yeah. can't pick your own team. Who Who's going to win the East? Who's going to win the West? And who's going to win the whole thing? Oh, okay. So I, I did my public one earlier, and I did Bucks over Sun, so I can't do that. So I will, I'm just fading Boston in this. I'm actually going to take Indiana. I I think they would really lean into this. I think I know Tyrese Halliburton during the team USA thing told Wendy, like I'm going to have my first TNT game ever this year. So I think being able to earn more of those games and earn that spotlight would be a big deal for him and this, you know, young team. Um, So I'm going to take Indiana over Fina. And I'm going to take Phoenix over Indiana. I think he gets them there. I, I think Phoenix is actually kind of underrated. Booker is just so nasty. KD is your second best player. It's just ridiculous. Um, so I'll, I'll take Phoenix in a, in a good finals. If I can't pick the Bucs. The Knicks got a healthy dose of Phoenix last, last Sunday where KD wasn't there. Obviously, Beal wasn't there. And they just had role player after role player stepping yeah. up. And it was like, is this a thing? Like, are they just going to? And you realize that Katie's missed all this time and they're on a winning streak when they came into the garden. And then Booker went off in the second half. He's just nuts, dude. And then his playmaking now, like he is filthy. Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll take Phoenix out of the the West too. I will go with Boston, especially if they get Porzingis back. Um, Yeah, that's a big one for them. And look, I don't mean this is disrespect to Milwaukee. I think they're the... They they've shown that they're progressing. Like this is... They haven't impressed me yet and they're 14 and 6. It's like the best compliment that I can give is that they're they're still in their figuring it out stage and they're still winning games. You know, imagine when they eventually find that what their their eventually finished product is going to be what how unstoppable it could be. Um but the the most unstoppable thing I've seen this year is when the Celtics are on yeah. like when they're hitting threes it's like oh so just the strategy against the healthy version of the Celtics is pray they miss. Yeah, you know, pretty much. that's that's yeah. when like when the Knicks played them opening night, they shot under 30 percent from three and they had a chance. The next time they played them, they just like shot 60 percent in the second half from three. And I was like, oh, <laughs> so this game's like, over. Uh, yeah, I guess we lose. Um, cool. So I'll go I'll go Celtics Suns and then I'll pick the Celtics to win it. And maybe yeah. the, disgusting the, of you to do this, by the way. I'm sorry. I'm Why sorry. I picked the Pacers, so I wouldn't have to think about Boston winning anything. And I'm sorry. But look, they get their <laughs> win now, and then the, the Bucks, when they're a finished product, have like, well, you already won that thing, so you're coming yeah. over confident now. You have yeah. to deal with us, you know. All I want is Miami Boston first round, just because I yeah. just it, and that's drive, the other thing about the, it'll the drive Miami, every Celtics fan mad. Yes, the, yeah. the, the, the other thing about the Miami game being closed just quickly, it doesn't matter who's healthy for Miami. It doesn't nope. matter at all. They oh, Josh Richardson just going to be Jimmy Butler tonight, just because it's. I, I can't stand them. It's begrudging respect, but it's also like, when are you going to stop? It's like LeBron. When are you going to yep. stop this? And they just won't. They're not going to stop this. So that's the Man, Don't want to play the heat in the first round. We've talked about it. Like you and I have talked about it on here. Yeah. Just like our, our frustrated respect for yeah. the heat and every single pod that I've, cause you know, the, the Mount Rushmore I've talked about of like, yeah. of, everyone of puts the heat rivals. on there. Sure. Everybody's got the heat <laughs> on there. And then I went and talked to Giancarlo yeah. About the about Our the guy. heat, and he's like, yeah, like we might be bad, but we know the playoff matter. time. It just like doesn't matter. Like we we know the we famous, have a chance. We've got famous, Spo. Yeah, the famous <laughs> drill tweet of like there is no difference between good things and bad things. It's actually true for the Heat. Doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Kevin Love was like his career was done, and now he's just like 
yeah, I'm just going to start here for a couple of years and look yep. up the whole franchise and shoot 50% from three or whatever. I'm just going to casually take lead the league in charges without breaking in half. Mm-hmm. Such a frustrating team. Yeah, I, uh, they, they might be a 33 win team that finishes 10th. I will still like need to see that 9 10 game. Yeah. Make sure that they're dead. <laughs> dead Cause that's all I know. They're going to win the 9 10, win the 8 10. And then as an 8 seed, they're going to make it to the finals again. So, yeah. Um, Ty, thank you for joining me to preview this matchup. I hope we have some fun this week and hopefully on Tuesday night, we have a good game though to watch and react to in what the NBA has. Like, like all jokes aside about this game, like mattering. It's like there's a tournament in December. Yeah, this game fun. used to be like, like, like I'm pro fun in, in yeah. my walk of life. And they made like last week when the Knicks were qualifying for the tournament, I was like, I'm kind of into this. Like they need to yeah. beat the, the Hornets by like 25. And they ended up like, rack it up. Let's go drive the yeah. score up. And so like job well done, Adam Silver. You've made me care about December basketball. Um, I'm I'm just curious how much I'll care about it if the Knicks are out of it next year, but <laughs> you know, if it costs them a player, but we'll see. Um, Ty, before you get out of here, um, tell the fine folks where they can find all you and all your stuff. Yeah, uh at Ty Windish on Twitter and Threads. Uh, I'm a Threads guy now, but you can find mm-hmm. all of uh, the links to our pod and YouTube and everything at, at gspn.info. Uh, and since I believe we are sharing this over please do I'll the plug, same yeah. for for any Eurostep listeners here so the Eurostep listeners first of all um i i know that part of that network is packers coverage um yes it is as bad as you think it is <laughs> for, for jets fans at the moment aaron runs our franchise and every jets fan wants them to clean house but they can't because nope. aaron needs to make this work because it was cap hold for the next three years. So yes, this is purgatory at the moment. Congratulations, <laughs> Packers fans. You won. Um, Sounds like a worse place than purgatory. To my me. goodness, just... man. I want everybody <laughs> fired. Literally everybody fired. Zach Wilson said, you're, uh, you're, I'm not, you're too Zach good. Wilson you know? said, I'm, I'm not too good for to you. I'm too good for you. Zach Wilson said that. And yet it's, oh and my it's God. Like, Par for the course. This is what the Jets have become. Uh, to the, those of you interested in basketball, follow Nick's Film School um, everywhere you get podcasts. We have a YouTube channel. Um, if you want, we have a merch store with like winter stuff. So if you just want like a beanie, check us out uh, at nickfilmschool.com. That's smart. That's smart marketing. I uh, listen. I know I'm Wisconsin talking to, to the yeah, Wisconsin yeah. folks. Oh, it's okay? snowy just, over here already. We nice. need that. It, it won't match your Bucks color schemes, but hey, there there may be something there that you're like, oh, this is a nice beanie. I'll go support that podcast that Ty went on. Um, so if you want to check that out, it's at nickfilmschool, S-K-O-O-L dot com. Just check out our merch store and all of our stuff is there. Uh, Ty, as always, this was awesome. It was. Thanks so much for, for having me on and can't wait for the game and appropriate trash talk afterwards. It's, it's so serious that, you know, I think we're going to be going crazy on, on socials at each other after this one. Exactly. I wish you the best of luck in every game except this one, sir. Except for the 50 between our teams in the next Exactly. Month. For the next 1100 <laughs> that we play. Exactly. Thanks as always, Ty. Yep. Thank you.